Christian Chase. The Amelia Earhart of Tanzania. Susan Mishibe right here on Rainmakers. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Stan. Um, I referred to you as the Amelia Earhart, and that's because you're the first FAA certified pilot, man or woman, from your country, right? Um, actually, I'm the first FAA certified pilot and ANP mechanic. Oh, so you're, you're an airplane mechanic too? Yeah, so that's, yeah, I have both qualifications. The, I was the first one to have both qualifications at the same time in Tanzania. Now, you actually operate an air transport business in Tanzania now, right? Yes, uh, I operate what is called a fixed base operation, which is a general aviation um, terminal at Kilimanjaro. Uh, airport in Tanzania and also handling services out of Dar es Salaam and other airports in Tanzania and Dakar. In really? Yeah. Okay. And, and you've been at it for over 10 years now, right? Yes. Because um, I, I heard you speak this morning because I needed, I needed to make sure that I was prepared and, one, and you were telling a great story as to how you got interested in airplanes in the first place and it kind of surprised me. Tell us that. <laughs> Yes, it's true that I was interested in aviation ever since I was four years old. I was born a third child and a third girl in our family. So when I was born, my parents wished I was a boy. So when my brother was born 18 months later, there was a big party to celebrate the birth of the first son in the family. And then when I was about four years old, my parents were f traveling by air to Dar es Salaam from Kigoma, where we were living, and taking along my brother, who was then uh, two and a half, and my parents had just had another baby girl by leaving me behind with my older sisters and our grandmother to look after me. So I remember as a four-year-old, when that airplane was taking off, I didn't cry. But I wish if I could fly that airplane, they will never leave me behind ever again. So that's when I started to be interested in aviation and my interest never changed hmm. to date. So I, I have to ask you this though. I didn't think women flew airplanes in Tanzania. <laughs> okay, what's the question? <laughs> you see one now. <laughs> yes, I do. Yes. Yes, I do. How did you do that? Was it easy? Uh, so I came to the States, actually, to fly, and uh, so when I turned 18, my father asked me what I wanted to do, and there was no question, I just said I wanted to become a pilot. And he said, oh yeah, so he looked uh, on the brochures of school, and then he said, yes, that's aviation, that was the first time I heard of the word aviation. And so arrangements were made for me to come join my sister, who was already going to college in South Bend, Indiana, that I should join her, and then I should also enroll into a flight program. So this is how I came to the U.S. to start off. Well, congratulations to your parents, because over the years we've had so many uh, people, particularly women, uh, who have been on the show from Africa, and they've talked about the struggles that they've had within their own family, where their family would not let them go to school. But your parents said, you know, Susan, go forth, go to school, learn as much as you can learn, and be a pilot. Yes. And I think uh, my father was an exceptional man. I'm in Africa at that time. Because when I came over here, my sister was um, actually staying with my aunt and her husband. And I remember um, they were responsible to enroll me to an aviation program. But I remember my uncle enrolling me to a travel and tourism, tourism class. Maybe I would be a flight attendant. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then I actually, after I did one semester of that, and I found a college that was an uh, aviation college and I enrolled myself. I could not even express myself properly. But then I said what I wanted to do. They understood what I wanted to do. You wanted to be a pilot. You wanted to get behind the seat and fly the plane. No, that I'd already started flying locally. I was oh. doing my traveling tourism course at Davenport College uh -huh. in South Bend, Indiana. And I went to an airport to find out how can I get flight training. 
and there was a flying club and I joined and I started taking lessons but then I could not communicate at the time I could in my English was so poor I couldn't communicate with control tower so my instructor said you know we cannot let you solo because this is a class C airspace which require communication with tower and you cannot land until tower says you are cleared to land you know some other airport you just call and to see who's around no one is around and you can land those are class D and G but class C you must get permission from tower and you must follow instructions and I couldn't I could not process what they are saying fast enough to react so I could have caused accident because we are airliners coming in with commercial passengers and uh, so I took time off and also that was I decided I'm going to find an aviation school to learn about maintenance and the engineering of an aircraft because I wanted to know everything about an airplane while I was improving my English because uh, when you are doing aircraft maintenance there's a lot of physics and mechanicals and math which do not require a language and I was already strong in math so mm -hmm. it was easy and I did not have to communicate back. So you're an airplane mechanic too? Yes. You know, forgive me, but when I, I look at you, I don't see airplane mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> I, you, I can see I'm very strong. <laughs> because, so yeah. you, you complete your education and then mm -hmm. you, you go back to Tanzania and you start up this company? No. So actually after I finish my, uh, um, now my um, maintenance training, I did my FAA, Oros Written and Practical, and I became a certified FAA airframe and power plant mechanic. And actually, I ended up working uh, repairing aircraft at night and going to college in the morning. And this is how I funded my flight training. So this is actually how I end up being the first person in Tanzania to hold both uh, qualification, a pilot and a, also being a maintenance engineer. Because um, it wasn't a plan but I had to do it while I was improving my language. Wow. <laughs> so, but then it ended up, I ended up loving it and I ended up working for four years, working on mm. aircraft on private jets. You know, as a father of two daughters, I just, I want to stand up and give you a high five so much right <laughs> now because that's an inspirational story with all of the work that, you're, that you've had to do to be able to satisfy your dream. Yes. But your dream has taken you back home. Yes. to where you have started this business mm -hmm. and that your business now is over 10 years old. Yes. Tell us about how that was to be a woman in business, especially in a business of air transport. Okay, so uh, when I finally went back to Tanzania to set up a business, I have to say setting up a, the challenge where the challenge because I didn't understand the business environment Mostly I did not understand the compliances, what I needed to do, legal compli compliances, even you know that tax compliances. I didn't. All I knew that I wanted to provide this service and that uh, people need the service I'll be providing and which from day one, from the first customer, we are this satisfied customer, no problem. But then the challenge were you know, to file your taxes. I didn't know how, or oh, so many things. But it was easy to set up or to do what I did because I was already a pilot and already a maintenance engineer. So I knew exactly what the pilot needed and what an aircraft needed. And the pilots were very happy. My customers were very happy because when we started, it was me and my assistant. And um, so we, all we had to do was to provide the logistic support for private jets because the mm -hmm. services in, in many places in Africa are not coordinated at one place like here in the U.S. You go to a private terminal where everything is provided for you. But to many places in Africa, you know, you have to go to Control Tower to find your flight plan. You have to go to a different location to get your fuel. You, you, different services are provided by different vendors. And they just wanted one place. And we became that one point of contact to coordinate all of that. Our customers never again went around to figure out where to get the services. Well, who wants to, who flies in on a private jet into Africa? 
uh, multinational corporations, oil and gas, uh, people coming for holidays. Uh, to give an example, um, Chevron could mm -hmm. fly. Because you know actually where these resources are, for example for oil and gas, they are at remote locations. They are not always at capital cities. And for such large corporations to use an airline, for a CEO such corporation to use an airline to try to get where they are going, it will be days with layover. You probably have to go to Europe. Let's say you are flying from Lagos to Dar es Salaam. You know, previously you had to go to Europe, maybe by British Airways, to come back. You know, that's a loss of productivity. Mm -hmm. But if you have a corporate jet, you can eat Lagos, you can go to Luanda in Angola, you can also come to Dar es Salaam in one day, and you can go home. So let's talk about how it is to do business in Tanzania. There, were, You talked about changing the way that, that you just didn't want to deal in cash. Yes. Because that was the way that it had always been done there. Yes. What's the problem in dealing in cash? Uh, in dealing in cash, first of all, it was not s safe. And in fact, when we were s setting up the business, that I did a marketing research and I ask various um, operators who have operated private jets into Africa and I ask, you know, what would they like, how was the experience and what would they like to see changed and it was a common theme that, you know, everywhere they go like people wanted cash, payment in cash and people are very slow and you have to pre-tip to get a service and sometimes you can pre-tip someone and someone will disappear, will not even return with the service and it is all they want is one place for them to go and if they can get a bill so they don't have to worry about it so when we started we already had in mind that's what we are going to do but we did not know on what kind of change or impact it was going to have locally we knew that our customers were going to be happy but Previously, as also the pilot mentioned, that they had to pay cash. And many of that, if it's a private jet, it can go at a place, you know, once a year, maybe once in their, in their lifetime, they will never return again. This means it, it was easy. There was no system to say, you know, what revenue were, f were generated through this particular flight. Revenue attract on commercial airlines scheduled because they're on contract and you know payments are made by transfer but if you don't have a contract you are paying cash and nobody was tracking that so when and so many times the cash ended up in people's pockets didn't really go to the government as intended and so was the government upset with you because you weren't collecting taxes no so we started collecting when we started we were collecting and our we were charging our customers did not pay us cash we are paying us using a credit card or wire and we would advance the payment even before we receive a wire we would write a check to the various government authorities like the civil aviation for navigation the airport authority for lending fees and different other vendors so then it's actually the people that when you you are going to pay by a check they'll be not happy at you because previously they are collecting in cash and that was an extra income for them. So now they're getting. When you a say check. that's an extra income, they're taking some yes. of that money. Yes, yes, they so were. You stopped the way that they did business. Yes, because I would give a check, you know, paid to the government. So the government was getting all the money, but then the people who were getting the cash before, they are not very happy by that. What do you mean by that? Well, because then. Um, then because we cut off a way for them to make an extra income which was not legal basically they were stealing money from the government the money should have been going to the government yeah. we started to ensuring that the money was going straight to the government it was not our intention to cut off everybody but it ended up being the best thing it served two purposes making our clients happy and making sure the government was collecting their levy. Was that, was that difficult to make that kind of change? I mean, when you as a business person, first yeah. off, 
you know, again, you're doing, uh, again, man's work, Yes. number one. Number yes. two, you're a woman business entrepreneur inside a country yes. that has traditionally been male. Yes. And now you're changing the way that they do business. Yes. Is that easy for you? No, then it did not become, when it came to that point, that's when it started to become quite a challenge. Like efforts and rules were made to make it a little bit difficult for me. I mean, now we can joke about it. We talk about it on how, like, the airport would create a rule just to make a life difficult for me and my clients, or even to discourage clients using uh, my company's services. Mm. So how, did that you, how did you handle that? How did you respond? Well, we had to work extra hard. There was a time, a period of um, two, three years, where you would spend almost 75% of your energy focusing on how, you know, these, it's a low level, when I say government, it's a low level clerks, we are collecting, we are not happy. Up above, they didn't know what was happening. So when I say government getting something and some people in government are being happy, like that, like it's clear like that, it's clerks, we are receiving the money. So they started making rules and so we are to make sure we do not give an excuse like everything has to be covered so for example if our flight was going somewhere and i was in there to sign a check they would ground that airplane and they would happily do that with the most humiliation way possible so that you know even the customers could say we should never use the aviation again look what happened we are grounded so to overcome that for example i would leave blank checks signed just paid to the civil aviation authority or airport authority so at any given time when a private jet comes in my office can just issue a check and the, our airplanes will not be grounded or also just even to make sure to go over the drill on how the airplane is going to come, where it's going to park, when the services are going to be delivered, and you have to follow up over and over again because if you didn't do that, then you know some services would not be delivered and at the time we depended on third party vendors because different vendors were providing different services. Mm. You know, I think I was wrong at the introduction. Um, I don't think Amelia Earhart had it as tough as what you've had. <laughs> so, um, but you have met, I mean, you've been at the World Economic Forum. You were a young leader at the World Economic Forum. You've yes. had other awards that we're going to be putting at the bottom of the screen. Um, how have you how have you been received globally in other countries, whether it's the United States or whether it's Europe, uh, when they're, they're looking at a, a woman entrepreneur from Tanzania? Actually, there, um, so actually, um, I have to say, I have been received very well. So for example, even uh, um, I was invited by the United Government to participate on a reverse trade mission in 2012. And, and a 19 member from different African countries. We came, we visited various um, light aircraft manufacturers in the US. And so out of nine people, they could have picked anybody, but they picked nine and I was one of them. And then when President Obama came, oh, actually, prior to that, in 2008, when President Bush did his African tour, so I was contacted by White House to assist with the logistic. So actually I traveled from Dar es Salaam, which was the first stop, and then to Kigali, Accra, and Monrovia, so I was traveling on board the White House press aircraft with the press and also Secret Service. So we had to l land before Air Force One lands and take off after because we have to make sure that all the services, all the, the media is staged and you know the local service providers are there to provide the services and we did that for all the locations. And so in 20, um, 2013, July 1st, when President Obama came to Tanzania, not only we did actually work with the uh, um, uh, US government through that entire mission, because you know there are so many preparations prior to, um, to the president visiting, but when he visited, I was actually invited now 
as a member of the business community. It was a 19 team member from across the continent because now the U.S. is actually moving from aid to trade and President Obama wanted to speak with the business community in Africa and to see how, what can be done to strengthen the business relationship between African businesses and American businesses. Mm -hmm. So for me to be there because of what I do, it was such an honor. Are, the, are the men business, business owners jealous? <sighs> Maybe some of them, but they can't because it's such a unique business. It's such a unique business. And then also moving forward on other people we've met, two mm -hmm. days later, uh, it was President Bush again, and this also was through the Initiative for Global Development, mm -hmm. where I was invited to speak uh, as a woman entrepreneur in Africa at the First Lady Summit. And uh, so also like sitting and having a conversation with uh, President Bush. So that acknowledgement, I think it, it meant a lot that so all the hard work was worth something. And even with President Obama, even to become the member of the Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum, because it wasn't easy and I was not looking forward to be acknowledged in any way. And in fact, I maintain a very low profile for a very long time because I thought if I'm very quiet and do my own thing, I would be left alone. Even in Tanzania, like not many people would bother me, but I would just do my job. But somewhere, somehow, I was, somebody noted and recommended me for something and something led to another. For example, uh, one of my mentors is Marisa Meyer, mm -hmm. and that is through the uh, Department of State and Fortune Most Powerful Women. They pair women um, from uh, emerging um, economies with um, CEO, women CEO of the, on the Fortune 500. So I was paired with Marisa. So then to work with her and to get her leadership skills from her was such a good opportunity. And then from then on and now actually uh, Wall Street Journal featured me mm -hmm. after uh, the meeting with uh, President Bush. And because of that, Credit Suisse s noted and they said, oh, we need to mentor her. They have an initiative where they are mentoring women from entrepreneurs, from emerging economies. And so they uh, came, they looked for me, and they say, you know, we w would like for you to participate on this program. So now I have two um, uh, vice president at Credit Suisse who are doing uh, providing executive coaching. So everything that I said I didn't know about, you know, taxing, you know, even to evaluate my company, even, you know, like human resource strategy, you know, you need to have employee handbook. I mean, my, my Credit Suisse, coaches they have actually another team of 25 members working with me to make sure now actually the company is you know doing preparing for the expansion because we are expanding and that we are going to uh, have a proper expansion and putting everything in place so this is all because of uh, i think uh, people realizing what we do is different and trying also to contribute and help mm. so uh, I want to change gears just a minute. Yes. Um, I heard you talk about how 9-11, 2011, changed things for you from a pilot standpoint. Yes. Um, you, you, you didn't have your business started by then, though, did you? No. But you were still a pilot. I was actually working still. I, I just finished my pilot training. I had my uh, commercial pilot certificate, and so now I needed to build the time so because to go work for the commercial airlines you need a, a minimum number of hours and i was there and you know there was a, a pipeline for me to join the major airlines here in the u.s and uh, but when september 11 happened like we saw what happened to the industry many pilots were followed many lost their jobs and i was not even an american citizen so i knew nobody did not have to tell me anything I just knew that there's no future for me here. But again, I worked so hard for that dream to go down the drain, so I figure what can I do now? So what's next? So actually that's when an idea to establish my company came. Actually somebody gave me this idea as when I was working as a 
maintenance engineer at Duncan Aviation in Michigan. We are doing a pre-purchase inspection for a private jet going to South Africa. And actually, they are the ones who say, do you know why do you want to work for anyone? Because I was already looking for work in Africa, not just in Tanzania, anywhere in Africa. And so they say, why do you want to work for anyone after they saw my resume? You know, you can start your own company to support, you know, people like wow. us. So now you fix airplanes, you fly airplanes, you buy airplanes too? No, I, um, I provide service for people <laughs> with airplanes. <laughs> so, yeah. all right, here I am in the United States. Yes. I want to go to Tanzania yes. and I'm going to fly on a private jet. Yes. How do I reach your company and say, I'm coming there and be ready for me? Okay, so the private jet industry worldwide is a close, it's, it's, a, it's a, like we know each other, for example, there's a National Business Aviation Association, which is uh, an organization that uh, all private jets operators, manufacturers, and service provider belongs to. It's based out of Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and I'm the African regional lead, so I'm the Africa person, so I sit on the committee. And so the industry is aware. And in fact, we never do a website. So even our, even our business grew up, grew through the word of mouth, but also through the National Business Aviation Association. And, they just, and also we have relationship with companies that provide these services. For example, let's say you could maybe be using a company called, uh, it could be Colts, one of them, there's also a company called Universal or Air Routing or Jeppesen. So you could be using their services and you say, you know, I am going to Tanzania. If you didn't know that we existed, Jeppesen would say, we do, we, you know, when you go there, Via Aviation will provide services for you. If yeah. you didn't know we existed, but many people in the industry know that we do exist. Because now many people, and many people may not know we exist because now many people use private jets. <laughs> but if you do, you know. Yeah. You know, for somebody who you didn't want anybody to find out about you, now everybody knows about you. Huh? <laughs> We're, yes. We've come to the end of our time, and I just wanted to ask you this one primary question. Yes. If there is an 11 year old girl out yes. there watching, uh, whether she's from the United States or China or Africa, um, and she has a dream too. What do you? What would you tell her? What, what would you tell her to do? So what I would tell an 11 year old is that they can become what they want to become. Anything they wish, if they want to become a doctor, if they want to become a pilot, if they want to become an astronaut, they want to become a computer engineer, anything, there's no limit just because they're women. Now the possibilities are endless. Fantastic, Susan, and thank you very much to Global Washington for hosting and bringing uh, Susan Mashibe to us. Uh, we'll see you next time right here. Take care. Rainmaker believes we can change.